Hello and welcome to the Aged Care Enrichment or ACE podcast brought to you by Silver Adventures. Every fortnight we invite aged care industry experts, thought leaders and passionate individuals to share their knowledge and experience with us as we examine ways to improve the quality of care and the quality of life for seniors. I'm your host Ashton Eve, and today we're talking to Dr. Jenny Waycott. Jenny is a senior lecturer at the University of Melbourne in the School of Computing and Information Technology, and her research is focused on human-computer interactions and how people are using technology in all aspects of their lives. Her most recent research has examined the ways in which emerging technologies can be used to enrich the lives of older adults, particularly in residential aged care, and she's done a lot of work with the staff of these facilities to understand how the technologies are being used and the possible benefits and ethical concerns of their implementation. In this conversation, we talk about some specific technologies like virtual reality and social robots, as well as some opportunities for self-expression and further social integration that new technologies can bring to older adults. This interview was recorded in mid-September 2020, so there are some references to the COVID-19 pandemic, but the information is still relevant no matter when you're listening to it. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Jenny Waycott. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jenny, on the podcast. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Can we start a a bit about yourself and your research? Sure. So I work in a field of research called human-computer interaction. So it's an interesting interdisciplinary area of research that brings together technology and looking at how we can design new technologies, but also a focus on people and how people benefit from new technologies, how people use technologies, what the experience is like when we're using new technologies, how we can improve that experience. So I I work in the School of Computing and Information Systems at the University of Melbourne, but I don't have a background in computer science. I come from originally a background in psychology. So I'm very much interested in the human part of the human-computer interaction relationship. And in the last eight years or so, I've been focusing on older people and designing for older people, designing for aged care settings, looking at how technologies are being used in interesting ways in aged care and to support older people who might be feeling socially connected, uh, sorry, socially isolated to help them feel socially connected. So, yeah, it's an area where I, I think there's a lot of potential for new technology to provide great social benefit, but it's also an area where there are a lot of challenges and there's a lot of, there's a risk of if things don't work according to plan, you know, actually creating problems for for the people using the technology. And so I'm quite interested in how we can make sure that we design and deploy new technologies in ways that are not only beneficial for the older people and for aged care, but also that don't create burdens or ethical challenges in that setting. Great. It sounds like there would be a lot of a lot of work in, in design, as you said, and reimagining the way technologies are used. Before we touch on that sort of area, can we, we talk about the actual research you're doing? Are you you're going into age facilities? You're working with developers? What does it look like, your day-to-day work? Yeah, so I'm currently working on a project that uh, it's sort of a program of research, I guess, and it's it's looking at emerging technologies for enrichment in later life. I'm focusing in particularly on residential care at the moment, but I'm also looking at other settings, so older people living independently. What I have been doing in the the, the last couple of years is focusing on looking at the technologies that are currently in use and how they're being used, how they're being incorporated into care activities, um, how they are being used to enrich the lives of people living in aged care, because as we know, aged care can be a, a place where people may feel disconnected from the world, especially at the moment. We've, we've seen that sense of disconnection really vividly this year. But it can also, it, it can be a place where there's not quite enough to keep people engaged and entertained. And so in terms of, I'm looking in particular at how technologies are being used for what I call enrichment, which is the name of this podcast. So not not necessarily for health and care, but for, for helping people to, to stay engaged in the world and to stay engaged in meaningful activities and to feel connected to other people and feel connected more broadly to the world around them. Mm. So that that work has involved predominantly interviewing um, aged care providers and technology developers about how they've been using the technologies 
uh, why they've gone into aged care in the case of technology developers, in the case of aged care staff, what are the challenges that they're facing, what are the opportunities they see for a range of new technologies and how they're incorporating those into their care activities. That's one arm of the research. There's also a number of other projects that uh, my students are doing, some of which involve more design activities or focusing on specific technologies such as virtual reality or social robots. A lot of that work at the moment, we're not, we're not able to, we haven't been able to proceed with it this year because of the limitations in getting access to aged care homes and you know obviously aged care has other have has other priorities at the moment so taking part in research is not central to to their issues while they're dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic which is understandable but at the same time we can see from what's happened this year how important it is to make sure that aged care homes are well set up to enable residents to stay connected and to use technology effectively so it's it's really important that they're well supported in in using technology in positive ways. Cool. And you said you're, you're spending a lot of time interviewing the staff at aged care facilities. What are you finding with their reaction to technology in the setting? Yeah, so I'm finding that the people that I've been talking to, and I acknowledge that this is a biased sample, so I've been talking to people who are actively using the technology in aged care, but they are, what I'm finding is that they're they often are incorporating technology-based activities as part of a person-centred care approach to caregiving. And so they're identifying particular needs that people have, so particular needs for connection that people have, and seeing where there's a role for technology to play in helping facilitate those connections. So they might be kind of specific examples, like somebody wants to be connected to their family to you know, remotely attend a family event, through to um, helping people to reminisce about life experiences by using something like virtual reality and, and, and visiting places that people previously visited or previously traveled to or grew up in and using that as a way of exploring life experiences. Great. And does it seem like the staff that you've spoken to are in favour of the use, this use of technology? Yeah, the staff that I've, I've spoken to are in favour of using it when it addresses a need. So mm. it's, it's not necessarily a blanket, let's use technology because technology is there kind of approach, but much more a case of this is something that we can see that the, a benefit that the technology can provide, a whether that's um, a, a virtual reality for traveling to another place or whether that's something as simple as being connected via Skype. They're, they're generally open to the opportunities that these technologies provide, but only in the sense that they respond to a particular need that the people they care for have. All right, so it needs to be somewhat targeted with the use of the technology. Yep. Great. Now, you've mentioned that some of your research has been involved in the ethical concerns of using technology in residential facilities. What concerns are there? So I view kind of the ethical concerns fairly broadly, and I look at what are some of the negative experiences that people can have and how can we avoid those negative experiences. So some of the ethical issues I guess I've encountered with technology like virtual reality, for example, is that it can be quite frightening for people and um, it can be difficult for the caregivers to monitor people's experiences and to be able to assess mm. how somebody is responding. And so you can inadvertently put somebody in a situation where they experience a fright because they are fully immersed in a virtual world and it's a 3D world and, you know, there might be the sense that things are happening behind you or that or that you're standing at the edge of a cliff or that you're one of the virtual reality experiences that seems to be quite uh, popular because it's quite a calming experience is to do an underwater uh, activity. But it may be that somebody may have negative associations with water. And how do you make sure that you've identified the right kind of activity to suit that particular person? How do you know, how do you make sure you know enough detail about somebody's life to ensure you're not kind of revisiting trauma, re revisiting a traumatic experience? And so I think in aged care, it can be particularly challenging to make sure that technology is used in a way that provides positive experiences because 
there's a lot of uncertainty around what sort of things are going to True. trigger negative memories and negative experiences. Um, and this can be as simple, I mean, I've mentioned virtual reality and, and being immersed in a virtual world, but it can be as simple as knowing what songs are going to bring people joy or that people might associate with experiences that they either don't want to revisit or that they feel grief about not being able to go back mm. to you know so there's there's also when technology is used for that to support reminiscence there is that issue of exposing people to the grief of revisiting experiences that they've shared with people who are no longer with them or revisiting experiences that they can no longer enjoy or as I said, revisiting traumatic experiences without without the caregiver knowing that that's going to happen. So that's, I mean, that's that's one of the issues that I think makes technology particularly, and, and any activity actually, particularly challenging in aged care settings. Absolutely. Do you, do you think that a key element in addressing this concern is having a very thorough person-centred approach and, and knowing the clients very well? Yes, that is definitely a strategy. And I guess that raises one of the key challenges for using technology well in aged care, and that is that it does require time. Sometimes technology is seen as an efficient uh, way of supporting augmenting care, you know, mm. but actually to do it well and to um, ensure it does have that enrichment that, that we're aiming for, it does require that person-centred approach to care, which does require knowledge about the person you're caring for which then requires the, the investment of time to to get to know the person and and probably the some of the more positive examples the the really lovely stories that have come out through my research have been shared by people who volunteer in aged care and so they're able to spend time getting to know a person and then as they get to know the person that that's when they start introducing some of the the activities using technology to help revisit life experiences. But, you know, that that kind of one-on-one -on -one support is not usually available in residential care settings. Yeah. What I really like about that, Jenny, is that it really dispels the myth that you can just bring in new technology and, and hope that it's going to fix anything. Technology has never been a solution. It's been a tool which, when used correctly, can be of assistance, but the connection with people is always going to be paramount. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So you mentioned um, VR and what other technologies are you seeing being used effectively at the moment? I guess another technology that gets talked about a lot is the use of robots in aged care. One area where robots are potentially effective is when they're pet robots. So when you've got um, things like Paro the Seal, it's been around for a very long time, but then we've got some other cheaper pet-like robotic toys that are just, they, they're very simple, they respond to touch and they just provide a sense of comfort for people. They seem to be very popular with some people. They seem to be very uh, a very effective way of giving people the sense of companionship that a pet might give them when you're not in a situation where you can have a pet or where the animals are not uh, not allowed to visit. I mean, most aged care homes do have animal visiting programs, but the robots can be a little bit more of a permanent presence. So this is, for example, a robotic dog that would sit on a lap or what kind of things do they do? Yeah, exactly that. A robotic dog that would, you'd pet it and it would move its head a little bit and, and make some small noises in response. And just, it can be, um, it can respond in a sort of very simple way, but just to show that it's it's an animated, somewhere between a soft toy and a more um, a more sophisticated robot. So it's it's just, just makes small responses to being petted and talked to and just provides that comfort of having an object to love in a way. In the situations that we've just been talking about, these are examples of technology being used with or for aged care residents or for older adults. How are older adults using technology themselves these days? Yeah, so there's some great examples. I mean, and, and a lot of older people are really active online and certainly I don't buy into the stereotype that once you reach a certain age, you're, you know, unable to use technology. But there's some really, really great examples of older people who, who are embracing online platforms like YouTube to share content and to really connect with younger generations. One of my favourite examples is it's a lady called Shirley Curry. She's in her 80s and she's um, got the nickname of Gaming Grandma 
and she plays she plays online games and uh, records you know her gameplay and shares that over YouTube and she's got this great YouTube following uh, all these people who who follow this this gaming grandma and her gaming adventures um, and I just love that example because it is it just defies the stereotype and it also because she's interested in this activity, there's no reason why older people can't be interested in gaming. You know, it's not a, it doesn't have an age limit. So she she enjoys it. She's interested in it, and it gives her that connection to this global intergenerational audience. And there are other examples like older people who have uh, YouTube tutorials on cooking. So you know, you might have your Italian grandma cooking um, tutorials on YouTube. And in fact, one of the first YouTube stars was uh, a man in his 70s at the time, and he was he shared videos of his um, his just talking about his life, talking about his adventures using technology, talking about some of the past adventures he'd had, and really through that the regular sharing of these videos and the comments from the audience, he was able to develop this really really interesting connection with this um, global audience. He's no longer with us, unfortunately, but it's a really, really interesting example of technology being used to, you know, help somebody feel connected to the world by sharing information about themselves. So they're not just feeling connected to the world by, say, watching news on TV, but by actively engaging in using the technology that's available. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that uh, in the design space, there's probably some room to, to tailor technologies or, or develop technologies that are more suited to older adults. What have you found in that area? What I've found, I guess, is that older people are quite keen to be involved in technology design. So if we, wanted to, if we want to kind of tailor technology for older people, we can involve them in the design process. Um, and again, there's some great examples of older people being involved in design. So there's a, um, an organization in the United States called Tech Enhanced Life, and they have regular sessions with a group of older people who they call the Longevity Explorers, and they come along to these workshops and basically explore prototypes or technology designs that they're evaluating for some of the companies in Silicon Valley. They critique the technology and they, they get involved in, in thinking about how technology can best be designed to support them. And they're, they're people who are aged in their 70s, 80s, 90s. So they're, we're not talking about necessarily the new retirees, but people who are further along in, in the old age journey. So that's a really great example. Uh, and, and some of the research that I've been involved in, we did something similar where we were uh, we worked on a project that involved developing a bespoke social virtual reality application that we trialed with a group of older people and we we worked closely with a group of older people who came into our lab on a monthly basis to explore different virtual reality applications to explore what those applications could do for them, what they would want out of a virtual reality experience where they would enter the virtual environment and interact with other people inside the virtual environment. And so we were able to create something that was very much tailored to their interests in that particular case. And this work was led by a colleague of mine, Stephen Baker. And in that particular case, we developed a uh, an environment that uh, was made to look like a, an old, a classroom, a fairly neutral school classroom. And so it was an opportunity to reminisce about what life was like in in school days so yeah I think if we're going to tailor technologies for older people the best way to do that is to involve older people in the design process and you know they have a wealth of rich life experiences to draw from they've got they've seen new technologies come and go they can critique technology from a perspective where they've got quite a lot of expertise on what they know works and what they know doesn't work yeah, fantastic. That's echoing a conversation we had a few weeks back with with Julianne Parkinson, who's the head of an organization called the Global Center for Modern Aging, which does that as well. They do a lot of research with older adults to design technologies and services. In the, uh, the prototype that you developed in your research with Stephen Baker, was this an avatar-based situation? People would have like a personalized avatar, they'd sit in the classroom and look around at each other? Yes, exactly. And so we had a PhD student, Romina Carrasco, who uh, designed the avatars with our participants. And so her research focused particularly on on the avatar creation and then how being represented via an avatar made people feel and, and what sort of 
what were some of the opportunities there as well as some of the challenges. So yeah, everyone was represented as an avatar and they came into this classroom environment to interact as avatars. It's, it was really, it's a really interesting concept. It's something a little bit more than what you can get through video conferencing because you're actually in a shared space. Mm -hmm. And did you find that the participants were expressing themselves through their avatar creation? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So Romina worked with the participants to create a photorealistic avatar, so an avatar that looked like them, and a cartoon avatar, so a more adventurous, creative avatar. And so the cartoon avatars were um, a really interesting way to explore identity and to explore how you might want to be represented. In reality, a lot of people chose to use the photorealistic avatars when they were actually interacting in the environment, but the process of creating a cartoon avatar was a really interesting creative process. And again, it's another example of using technology creatively and actively to express yourself. Absolutely. One of the, um, one of the common tropes in, in gaming these days seems to be the ability to, to fill a role that you would not normally fill and to explore the, the depths of the character that you might inhabit. And it's a really interesting idea that within technology for older adults, this could be a new avenue of exploration as well. Yeah, absolutely. Some interesting examples were things like one of the male participants created a cartoon avatar that had him really muscular because he'd always considered himself to be quite, you know, thin. And, um, and I suppose there's an element of coming to terms with some of the frailty that you might f experience as you're getting older and, mm -hmm. you know, just being able to embody a, an avatar that was um, represented the exact opposite to that frailty was quite interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. I could see there might be a way in recognising that this particular participant wanted to be seen in a certain way. Perhaps there are situations in virtual reality you can build that really capitalize on on what older adults want to feel and what they feel their shortcomings might be and how to address those. Yes. Yeah. Now we, we kind of touched on the idea of ageism being a, a factor in, in people's perceptions of older adults with technology. Do you think it's fair to say that in 20 years, older adults will have more familiarity with technology or is it going to change in a way that we won't be able to keep up with? I think probably the latter. Like, look, I'm not, I again, don't want to suggest that um, older people are always going to struggle to be on top of technology. But the fact is things change a lot and what we learn in our younger years is not necessarily going to be around as we get older. So, I mean, I notice it myself, you know, just the difference between me and my teenagers um, in terms of what we're familiar with is, you know, there's there, there are differences. and But that doesn't mean that people can't... Um, stay active and involved in using different technologies. It just means that this idea, there's often this argument that as soon as people who are currently using social media, you know, reach a certain age, then the, all of those issues around digital literacy are no longer going to exist. But I think I think those issues will always be there as long as the world keeps changing. Not being um, able to use technology is not a universal constraint for people, but there will always be people who feel a bit left behind because they feel like the world has moved on faster than they've been able to keep up with. I think we always need to be mindful of making sure that things, that, that aspects of society are accessible for, for all. Mm. And I think the way that you've been researching as well, the research you've been part of, actively seeking the involvement of older adults. And it sounds like that moving forward, that's going to be a key factor in, in the adoption of new technologies by older adults is, is actively welcoming them in to use them. Yes, definitely. Um, depending on how the technology is being used, what setting it's being used in, what the context is, it's important to involve older people, but also others who are included in that as users. So in, in residential care, for example, the staff members play a really crucial role. So it's important to involve them and to understand their perspectives on some of the constraints that affect their working lives and, and making sure that the technology, if it's going to work well, that it fits into that those, those environments. So, yeah, it's about involving a, a whole network of people in the process. Absolutely. I guess the, um, the care providers are the facilitators of the technology in a lot of situations. Yes, definitely. We're almost running out of time, but I just wanted to, to ask you, we've, we've spoken about 
technology being used as a tool to address specific problems and, and I know you mentioned isolation are there other key areas you think technology can be really instrumental in, in helping address yeah so my work has focused mostly on addressing isolation or facilitating a sense of connectedness to the world and so even people who are not necessarily socially isolated can still they might have personal relationships with others but they may lack that broader connection, for example, or vice versa. There's a whole area of work on um, the use of technology for um, for healthcare. Uh, I'm not looking so much at that so uh, because I've been so focused on kind of the, the social aspects. But I guess, and I've touched on this a fair bit, there's also that just that sense of being able to provide people with an opportunity to engage in meaningful activities and do something that's fun. So... You know, it's not it's not always about connecting with other people. Sometimes it's just about having opportunities to to do things that you enjoy. And not everybody enjoys the kinds of activities that are on offer in aged care settings, like, for example, your games of bingo. Um, so having those kinds of individual fun based activities can be really valuable for some people. So it's it's about um, just making sure people have lots of different things to do and that's where you know that's where social technologies provide an advantage and games and you know there are um motion-based games that could help people to kind of do something fun at, and at the same time stay active so yeah that's th th those are some interesting areas mm, I, I like the idea of technology as a part of a, a social care not just a, a health care that, that's often implicit in in these uh, residential facilities yes jenny we're, we're pretty much out of time is there anything you'd like to touch on today or anything you, pe you think people should know about your research before we go so some of the, the work that i've been doing precedes 2020 mm -hmm. and i'm very interested to learn about how aged care organisations have innovated in response to the challenges that they have faced this year, especially in terms of keeping residents connected in residential care, but also in uh, for care services that operate at a community level. So how, um, how have organisations enabled their clients who live in the community to stay connected and to stay involved in some of the activities that they've run? So there are some examples of libraries, for example, that have um, telephoned all of their all of their older um, what's the word for a library members or yeah older members members is the right word yes um, and so I am currently embarking on a follow up study to look at how um, aged care organisations both in residential care and in community based care have innovated in response to COVID nineteen in order to help older people stay connected. Mm, and are you optimistic that coming through the pandemic, there'll be lots of findings of how people can, how technology can be used more effectively? Yeah, I think that's, I think it's a really interesting opportunity to suddenly, for, for people who may have, you know, thought technology was too hard to have suddenly embraced it. And there'll be a lot of lessons to learn from that, including you know, not just what the opportunities are, but also what the challenges are and what we need to do to make sure that people are well supported to be able to do this effectively going forward. Fantastic, Jenny. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Aged Care Enrichment Podcast, brought to you by Silver Adventures. If you'd like to find out more, you can visit our website at www.silveradventures.com.au that's S-I-L-V-R Adventures. And of course, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to make sure you don't miss out on the next one. My name's Ash Deneef. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you next time.